Um, this is the meeting of the Northwest London CCG governing body and is being held in public. The meeting is being recorded um, and this recording will be available on the CCG on the CCG website afterwards. Um, so people should just, just note that. Um, anyone who is not a member of the governing body or a formal attendee will not be called to speak until the public Q&A is um, part of the proceedings and there is um, time allocated for that. And we have had uh, questions from the public. Um, you will note that the agenda item is, is items on the governing body today are, are fairly light and that is in view of um, the pandemic that we are in and where the NHS is still in a level four national incident. However, we felt it was quite important to just have, have to have a governing body in public, um, A, to assure the public um, and B, also to maintain our public accountability. Um, so, with that, I'm going to move straight on to the introductions. So I'm Winnie Palmer, I'm a GP and I'm chair of Northwest London CCGs. Um, and can I move to Alex? Good afternoon, my name is Alex Johnston. I'm a lay member of the governing body and chair of the Remuneration Committee. Carmel? Carmel Carthill, lay board member and vice chair of quality. Richard? Richard, is Richard Smith here? I'm Richard Smith. I'm a lay member of the governing body and I chair finance and performance committee. Jane Howden. Hello, I'm, I'm Jane Howden, secondary care doctor and chair the quality and performance committee. Philip. Philip Young, lay member and chair of audit committee. Um, Mona. Mona Vardia, GP uh, for Westminster Bar. Vijay. Vijay Taylor, GP, clinical lead for Ealing. James, James Kavanagh. I don't think James is here yet, Chair. OK, OK. Um, Radhika. Hi, I'm Radhika Balu, Baro lead, interim Baro lead for Harrow, please. Ian, Ian Goodman. But Ian, um, Andrew, Andrew Steeden. I'm Andrew Steeden, I'm the clinical borough lead for West London. Thank you. Um, Steve. Steve Bloomer. Hi, I'm Steve Bloomer. I'm the ICS CFO and I'll be covering for Joe as the uh, accountable officer today. Thank you. Um, is Pippa on the call or is Jennifer covering? I'm expecting Jennifer? I'm expecting both. Yeah. Okay, so we Jennifer, are you there? I'm here, sorry, Chair. Yes. Jennifer Roy, Director of Nursing. Okay. Shankar. Hi, I'm Shankar VJ, GP and Northwest London Sessional GP representative. Thank you. Um is anybody covering from Brent? I know MC is not here. Okay. Uh, Vanessa? Hi there, I'm Vanessa Andre. I'm the Northwest London Practice Nurse Representative. Finn. Hi, uh, Vanilla O'Donnell, Practice Manager Representative. Thank you. Um, and those that are next to the members who are in attendance, um, is Adam there or Asia from the LMC? Yeah, I'm Adam Jenkins. I'm the Local Medical Committee Representative. Thank you. Is Asia there um, as well? No, okay. Uh, Bernie? Bernie is an apology chair. Okay. Councillor Steve Curran? He is also an apology. Okay. Lynn Hill? Or Daniel West from Health Watch? I don't think Daniel is here either. Okay. Is uh, Rob here, Rob Hood? He has not yet joined. Okay. Rory? <laughs> Good afternoon, Rory Hegarty, Director of Communications and Engagement for the CCG. Simon. Simon Carney, uh, Head of Governance for the CCG. And Josie. Uh, we've got Roxana instead of Josie. Today. OK, Roxana. Roxana. I'm Roxana, Senior, Senior Governance Officer. 
Okay, we've got a series of apologies uh, from Joe, um, Annabelle, and we've got Mark Jarvis and Martin. Is Mark here for, uh, for uh, Mark, are you here? I am, and Mark Jarvis, uh, Assistant Director of Primary Care Integration for Hounslow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we've got apologies from Genevieve, Sarah Crowther, Bernie, and Councillor Curran. Okay, so. Sorry, um, sorry Chair. Sorry. Sorry, Chair. Um, Pippa Nightingale Centre, apologies. Okay, Jennifer, you're, you're, you're standing in um, you. for her, aren't you? Excellent. Um, any interest, register of interest, which are not noted in the register? Okay. Let's do the minutes of the meeting of the 21st of October, um, page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. Any um, questions on the minutes, please? If not, we can mark those as accurate. And then I'm going to move straight on to the actions. Rory, are you going to just take us through the actions, where they are and what's in what's scheduled and what's in train, please? I, I, I can do I uh, the majority. Do that. Yeah, I, I'll, okay. I'll do the majority of that. I think uh, Rory will speak to the final one on the okay. action log. Um, so you will see that um, uh, they are uh, due uh, on the agenda for the next meeting, uh, most of them uh, apart from one. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting it. It won't come up on my screen. There we go. So uh, actions 13, 17 uh, and 16. Sorry to not do that in order uh, are coming in March. Uh, action 15 will be coming in April and action 14 is on the agenda as part of the AO's reports. Uh, action 9 team about PPGs, I think Rory can speak to. R Rory? Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry, I keep going on mute because there's planes going overhead. Um, so we have now received some um, funding around from, from NHS England nationally to support our work with um, primary care around not just PPGs but that whole wider involvement issue of um, PPGs um, so I think there was there was something missed in the in the reporting of this which I think has been amended now but we are mm -hmm. we are taking that work forward and we're very keen actually to talk to some of the people involved in PPGs at the moment as part of that work so um, it's I, I think it's really positive that we have got funding we will be working with bringing in expertise in the voluntary sector and so on around how um, primary care really works with 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 local communities and, and broadens its reach into those communities so i think it's a yep. positive step but i'm sorry that action was missed from last time which i think has been amended yep. in the minutes and rory you're going to respond to the public questions on that when we come yes, to so those later. Yeah. okay thank you um i'm just going to move then on to my report uh, i'm going to pull out three or four key things um, it is on, on the website. First of all, um, welcome to Rob Hurd. Um, I don't think he's here today. He has joined as the new North West London ICS chief exec. He came into post from the um, 6th of January. So a big welcome to him um, as he works through how we transit from here on to the ICS becoming a statutory org, um, authority. And as you all know, there has been a delay in that legislation. Um, the other important thing I wanted to pull out was um, the concern around primary care leadership as we move forward into the ICP. And you will see from the report that a number of appointments have been made. Um, and, and that is really good because it's important that we have clinical leadership 
right the way through um, our programs of work. Um, significantly, people will note that Genevieve Small has been appointed as the Associate Medical Director for Primary Care uh, for Northwest London. And Vanessa Andre, who is currently our practice nurse, has been appointed as the Director of Nursing across Northwest London. So a big congratulations to both of them and, and, and a big welcome. Um, the borough medical director roles have been appointed to, um, with one that still happen, needs to happen, and, and, and then you will see further on on, on the various programs. Um, the other important thing I wanted to talk about was regarding COVID and Omicron. People obviously have been seeing the news, um, and it looks like we are cautiously, I would say, um, on, on, on the descent um, with, with this wave. Um, we know that it peaked somewhere around the end of December um, and started to plateau thereafter uh, with, with us really having significant uh, prevalence in the community. Though, as we all know from the data, the uh, relationship with, with hospital admissions um, was, was, was broken, which was good. Um, and that was largely due to the immense effort on vaccinations from the public who came forward and from all the primary care and the community pharmacists and the trusts who actually administered the vaccinations and the boosters. So a big thank you to them. As we all know, this time there was a, a, a significant impact on staff absences because of the sheer prevalence of the disease. And there was a point when our absence, staff absence was running at about 6.8%, and that is what was in the paper. It has since then come down, um, but but we still we still we still have an have have an issue there. Um, I think we've seen the change in in moving, stepping away from Plan B and the proposed change in uh, in what what we need to do. But I think we need to just watch and see how COVID uh, behaves over the next few months. Um, it is really important that we, we, we give a real accolade to the vaccination program and the work that Andrew um, and, and the team have done on this um, and, the, and, and the significant um, impact with boosters, because that is what has made the difference um, dur dur during, this, during this wave. As we come out of the pandemic, the, the issue with recovery backlog, both in secondary care, mental health and primary care, will need to be a complete focus um, and we'll be working alongside our colleagues um, to get to a place where we can soon plan how we get back to 1920 delivery. Um, through, through, through the pandemic and through winter, uh, primary care received some additional funding for winter access and that has really been a portion towards getting appointments, improving telephony, improving um, access. And, and through the bank holiday weekend, as it always happens, we had the rollout of the monoclonal antibodies and, and, and potential antivirals. So a lot of primary care was working through that period as well. Um, I'm going to pause there unless there are any questions um, on my report. A big thank you to all the staff who have really worked through the winter um, the second winter running. Um, let's hope we don't we don't have to have do this again. So thank you very much. With that, I'm going to hand over to Steve. Thank you. And um, so uh, I'm just going to take us through um, the accountable officer report. So um, as as we've said, we've been through um, a surge, and one of the encouraging things is how well we've responded uh, as a system. And um, and actually, uh, the, the, the way in which teams. Uh, Steve, have you frozen? I can you still hear me? If I, my yeah, yeah, I can, I can hear Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, so the way in which um, the, the North West London came together, particularly um, through the, the gold and, and the excellent efforts uh, from, from Genevieve, who was fantastic, uh, leading gold. Um, we've seen some incredible efforts in the vaccination sprint, and I know Andrew's going to um, pick those up later on the agenda. Um, and, and, and as Mahini said, some, some excellent uh, work in terms of keeping the remote monitoring, optometry, and, and as well as business as usual uh, going as well. 
Um, and I think you know the, the professionalism across the system is something that we can all be proud of uh, and, and what's been achieved. Um, it is disappointing in that time that we saw that the uh, ICB has been put back. Um, but, um, you know, from our perspective, um, organisational form can't get in the way of all the, the things that we've set out to do. So we will continue to work hard in terms of through our agreed programmes of work to reduce the inequalities, improve access and uh, and, and and outcomes through the primary care, local care, mental health and acute uh, work streams, but Rob will be doing quite a lot of work as he uh, as he goes round to, to talk to colleagues to assure them that the, the process and the plans and how we plan to move uh, seamlessly across to the ICB. So I think you know a lot to do, but we are making uh, continue to make pretty good progress. So happy to take any comments on the report. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments for Steve? Okay. okay, right. Thanks, thanks, Steve. Um, should we move straight on to item six, which is the update on the um, vaccinations program? Andrew? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I wasn't I wasn't um, aware I was talking to this, but um, so just to say that um, the vaccinations program is ongoing. Um, we have been um, we have been rolling out the booster campaign now since the end of September. Um, we had a uh, COVID vaccination booster sprint um, before Christmas when we were asked uh, by the Prime Minister to vaccinate the whole adult population um, by the end of December. So we increased the capacity in Northwest London to be able to do that. Um, so we moved from vaccinating on average about 65,000 patients a week uh, and try to set up a vaccination capacity for about 220,000, 220,000 vaccines a week. We never quite got to that target, but we were very close on several weeks. Um, we maintain the um, the capacity to deliver the vaccine campaigns, uh, the booster campaign to the general population, although demand uh, seems to be dropping in the last couple of weeks since Christmas. Um, since Christmas, we have restarted the school vaccination campaign um, and also setting up vaccination campaigns to support the delivery of boosters to students returning to London as well. Um, the vaccine campaign has been primarily through the LVS primary care sites, but very, but very uh, well supported by the pharmacy sites as well. Um, and uh, we are planning and preparing um, to start vaccinating children uh, 5 to 11 who are clinically extremely vulnerable um, and planning to do that once we get the um, vaccines, uh, uh, paediatric vials supplied um, so that we can start to do that. I'm very happy to take questions and I'm aware we've got some questions coming later on from the public. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much for all the efforts that you have you've done in this. Any questions from members of the governing body? No. OK. Thank you very much. Let's move straight on to our item, which is the finance report. Steve. Steve, are you? Ah, I mean, okay. so, sorry, I, um, I lost connection there. Um, so I wasn't going to say an awful lot on, on the finance report. Um, we bought the full detail here because um, we haven't had a chance to go through it in the normal way with finance committees because a number of uh, meetings were stood down. I think all the, in terms of the main messages, um, we remain on target to achieve the planned position um, and potentially slightly exceed it of a 20 million uh, surplus for the second half of the year, um, which will add on to the 6 million surplus of the first half of the year. Um, and actually, uh, in terms of uh, funding within Northwest London, we are, you know, we're not seeing pressures to put additional funding into Northwest London at the moment. So we're very confident of that position. Um, and uh, you know, so I'm ha we're now beginning to plan um, for 22, 23, really uh, more so because we're quite confident of this. So very happy to uh, take any questions on the report. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, and I know most of the meetings were stood down um, over the last six. I've got somebody's hand up. Ian. Yeah, um, 
Steve, I, I noticed that on the primary care overspend, the area of overspend is mainly in the prescribing. And I just wonder whether it's a coincidence or not that this is the the medicines management teams were the ones that were hit probably the hardest borough by borough and the ones that are reduced most borough by borough. And, and whether we're seeing the impact of that uh, being on the uh, overspend in, in prescribing. So, um, so I think that definitely has had an impact in, um, you know, it, it, it is an area, as you say, um, and obviously colleagues were working on, on other things. Um, but there is on top of that, there is a, a, an element of inflation in there as well, which would have been, you know, which would have happened uh, anyway. Um, it's something that I'm really keen to be a little bit forensic on so that we can help the team uh, in, in terms of next year, whether that's uh, ensure they've got a full establishment and, you know, the right resources to do the job or, you know, but we really want to get into that going forward. But you're absolutely right. That is an area that, uh, and, and, and therefore some of the, the things that we plan to do in this this sort of second half of the year, we haven't managed to do. Thanks. Yeah, because the pharmacy colleagues were all deployed yeah. with, to support the vaccination effort. Yeah, no, thank you. Any other questions for Steve? Okay, if not, um, Jennifer, can I come to you for quality and performance, please? OK, so I'll pick up the quality element. Um, so just to say about um, the eight month aid report, um, it's not been many changes since we reported the last governing body. We are still seeing a number of their size serious incidents reported by the providers um, and the overall trends um, is related to 12 hour trolley breaches. We're seeing the maternity around cooling of babies, treatment delays and infection control. Um, we have not seen any never events reported, so that's really good um, um, good news to say for this month. And in terms of the national learning um, from patient safety events, um, we are starting to see the GPs reporting and the quality and safety team are actually doing some more intense work. But obviously with COVID, um, that's been delayed. So we're hoping in the next couple of months we'll be able to bring a report to the Quality and Performance Committee. Um, so those are the key messages. Happy to take any questions. Okay. Any questions for, in terms of CHC, we are okay, are we? I, that was the one thing that I wanted to, yeah, we seem to be, the assessment yeah. seemed to be, yeah, yeah. yeah. We are, coming we down are, nicely. They are coming down nicely, and I think the target is to try and get that down to, to an acceptable level by the end of March. So they are making good progress. And, uh, Excellent. Thank you. Um, Steve or oh, Jonathan, are you going to take through the performance? Oh, sorry, I've got two questions. I beg your pardon. Sorry, Ian and then Richard. Um, actually, my question can wait till after the performance. OK, Richard. Um, th thank you, Mahini. Um, two, two things just to say on the quality report. I'm one, I was really pleased at the increase in establishment in London ambulance operations because over time that should help us to get that back under control. Yeah. That was a really nice piece of news. Um, my question was actually on, on page 10, the uh, what's now the learning from patient safety event system. Um, sorry, I don't get the terminology right. And um, Jennifer, really, the, the question was, do we have any data on GP sign up rates to this system and to check that all the North West London commissioners are signed up to the new system? Because it will clearly only work if all the relevant people are have a login to the system. Yes, so that's yeah. a piece of work that the quality team are doing at the moment. So I know they've, um, Judith and Mello has been to Hillingdon and I think Hillingdon has been signed up. Um, so one of the things that we want to bring back um, when we're able to have those more detailed conversations with the practices is to bring to the Quality Performance Committee a list of all the GP practices that have been signed up to the, the system. I think what we found out, Richard, is that a number of the um, practices have had got local databases that they are reporting on but what we need to do is translate the information onto the national database so when NHS England do their themes thematic reviews um, they can then look at it across London and across the UK so that's positive to one degree but yes we do need to make sure that we capture all the practices and that's a piece of work as I said we'll be doing. We've, we now have got access before we didn't have access to Lipsy, so um, the quality team. So, and that was a glitch in the system. Um, so, NHS England are working on that, and hopefully, in the next month or so, 
we'd be able to go into the, um, the database and for ourselves have a look at all the practices that are signed up. Thank Richard, you. further question? Further question? No, that, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. I just wanted to be sure that we were sure. <laughs> following that through. Yes, it's, it's one of our actions to do because we have to report up into NHS England as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Steve, is Jonathan here to talk through performance? I'm here, Mahini. Oh, hi, um, Jonathan. Okay. Hi, hi. Um, so, uh, so you have in your papers the month seven performance report. Um, I was going to, I'll take the report as read, but I was going to highlight five areas. Um, I think the five important areas. I think the, and one of the, a couple of them we mentioned already is, is workforce within the report. You can see that we've got increasing sickness, vacancy, and turnover rate across the uh, across the CCG ICS, and and this clearly has been exacerbated through the 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 recent COVID wave. So we'll be a significant risk to delivery of all our targets in Q4. Um, you'll see in the report that the, there's been an increase in our long length of stay in our acute trusts and uh, and and that impacts on capacity and flow through the hospital. So that does have an, an impact on our front end of, of and front end performance. Um, that has been a focus uh, past Christmas at gold daily gold meetings to make sure we target the right amount of discharges so that so that we we create a balance in the system um covid and covid boosters have been mentioned great progress but uh, and, and we can see that we continue to, to to make slow progress in the total adults that are receiving the jab overall um and the two further areas and final areas we are still making progress in reducing the very long waits on our elective pathway so the 104 week RTT weights are reducing, but we still have got and we still have increasing waiting lists across the system, which is which will be a, a challenge for for the next quarter. And and the final area um, I was going to highlight was that we, we have got some in increasing ambulance handover weights um, through pressures from our urgent care system. Um, and we're working very closely with the LAS to make sure those are minimised, uh, especially over Christmas, where we've agreed a, a five-step escalation ladder with the LAS. I was going to stop there. Those were the five key yeah. items, Mahini. Thank you. Um, Ian, and then I had a question. Right. Yeah, so, John, thanks very much, and, and thanks very much for highlighting the areas. But there are 127 pages of graphs, on which is basically death by graph. And, and I wonder whether there's a way you can we can either sort of reduce it so the data that we need to know is there and is and is front and centre because I don't think many people can actually take in all that data and really realise what the impact of it is. I know the NHS uh, requires huge amounts of KPIs, but I think it's beyond most people's scope to actually um, take in all that all that data. Um, and, and also have a meaningful discussion at a meeting about it. Thank you. Um, uh, Jonathan, while you are asking that question, I just wanted to pull out, yeah, I know the elective and inpatient activity is being looked at with RTTs. Um, what about non-elective outpatients and so on? Are we, are we going to report on something like that? Because there's a considerable amount of delay on the 18 week there as well. Yeah, the, the key issue for us, Mean, is to really increase our activity levels back to yeah. pre-pandemic. And we are doing yeah. really, really well on our outpatient activity and diagnostic activity. We're not doing so well on the elective work, and so that partly explains it. Also, um, clearly pre and through the pandemic, we, we've missed a number of referrals that are now coming in. So as an example, our referral rates in cancer for cancer referrals are going up and activity levels are going up in that category. So, you know, we are catching up. So I think there's 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 there, there's some really good areas, but the, the overall concern of having a, an increasing waiting list overall and, and people waiting over a year is a significant concern. In, yeah. in terms of a response to Ian, I think we I'm, I'm trying to make sure that there's a proper, very clear summary on the first four pages of the report and uh, and and we pull out the key metrics within that 
and then we step through into a high level summary for each program. Um, and and so we are trying to make make sure it's an easy read. And this has developed over the past six months uh, in a way for for how people have asked it to be developed. Well, what I what I'll try and do is improve that summary at the front end, and if that's and, and maybe I'll call you and, okay. and see how we can do that. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Ian. Point well made. Richard? Um, thanks, Mahini. I, I, I was I really wanted to respond to Ian as much as anything in that this is a comment that I've made a couple of times in meetings to Jonathan. I think it's a, a phenomenally good source of data, this report, and it has been getting better and better. The question I've always asked has been about how on earth do we mine such a vast treasure trove? And I think I have come to do what Jonathan has said and, and kind of trust the summary at the beginning to guide my thinking initially. And then rather than trying to read every page of the report to try to think about what are the areas that I believe may be concerns within um, the work of the CCG and then to look for the specific answers to that those questions in the data. I, so it's coming coming at it the other way around is the best I've been able to do. Yeah. Point well made. Carmel. Yes, Jonathan, I've, well, I've been looking at paediatric A&E attendance and that's been on an upward trajectory all through, um, well, really since last April. Um, has that continued into winter? Jonathan? I need to come back to you, Carmel. I'll, I'll try and look while we're at the meet on the meeting and then ping you a note. I, I, I felt that we were on target from the latest report, but I just need to check. I may have plateaued out, but you see, we, we started in April at 7,000 a month and we we're right up to, to nearly 13,000 by October. Um, so I yeah, but some of that was also in April. We were in the depths of the pandemic, weren't we? So I think we should we need to compare with 1920 numbers, don't we? Really? Yeah, you. If we started at say June when it was 10,000, it's not such a and still yeah, yeah. nearly 4,000 jump. Um, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions on the performance report? But somebody's got a hand up. Is that Kamal? That's yours. That's uh, any it's me actually, Mohini. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi. It's Hi, just, Radhika. Hi. It's it's just that I was just looking at you know this uh, this gave me a lot of actually information, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, the, there was one. Uh, uh, the, there were page twenty eight where we look at actually post COVID syndrome and acute clinic referrals, and the referrals seem to have come down drastically. So I was just wondering, are we is, does that mean that primary care is actually confident about dealing with post-COVID, or is it just that patients are not, we are not actually, you know, the activity, does it, is it just that we've experienced a surge and we've not been able to look after our post-COVID patients? I, I'm not sure what it means. So it's, it's just that. And the other thing which was of interest to me was also regarding the suicide rates across different boroughs, which was on the mortality data and the last. And is that a compilation over three years or is it something just over the last one year or so? Because it says 2017 to 2019. And uh, is it something actually, you know, that we need, uh, that that's a clarification that I wanted. And the reason behind that is this, there's a significant gap between the male and female actually suicide rates. And it's different across the different boroughs. And how are we looking at it? And is there some something of a suicide prevention program happening in those boroughs? Thank uh, you. Just coming back to post-COVID, um, Jonathan, is there a data error there? Because I sit on the post-COVID steering group and I have not seen a fall-off of referrals. OK, I, I thought that there had been a reduction in referrals uh, um, for a, a good reason, that, they, that that we weren't expecting as many referrals in that time yeah. period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we think about what we modelled and what we are getting, yes, there is absolutely a gap. But uh, we also know that um, uh, St Mary's had the weight and London Northwest didn't. So we are actually triaging and 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 seeing if we can get people to the to where they're the shortest weight. Um, so yes, if you're looking from from what was modelled, then it's a different story. But maybe mm -hmm. worth looking at that data. 
Yes, and then the focus is on making sure that we 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 um, bring people in as quickly as possible. Is uh, yeah, and, uh, and and just to reiterate, uh, Radhika, also every borough now has a community triage, so that actually people who can be uh, redirected straight into a therapy, whether it's mental health or rehab, can that can happen rather than just waiting to go to a clinic unless there's a diagnostic dilemma. Um, we can we can see and treat, and then suicide. Um, so we, we put the suicide rates, the precursor for the population health program, and the, the, there is a set of metrics around population health and that will drive a number of areas of work. I don't know and I haven't got the list of uh, specific pieces of work around suicide across northwest London, but I'll ensure to include that in the next report um, so that we list the, the, re the response to that question. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Jonathan? OK. Um, there are many reports which have been circulated just for noting with with with, with minutes there. Um, that sort of concludes the business for the um, the governing body. Was there any other business from anybody else that you wanted to flag? Anybody wanted to flag before I move to questions from the public? No. OK, um, we're now, now going to move the section on questions um, from the public. We have received these in writing um, and as per our, our terms of reference and previously determined, we will only take questions uh, for items on the agenda. Other questions which members of the public quite rightfully will have will be answered either in writing or uh, verbally and also be published on the the website. So let's I would suggest um, we have previously said that members of the public can ask the question. May I suggest people um, get to the question so we can get a robust response um, for yourself. So I'm going to go first to Mr. Tizard. Mr. Cesar, you had um, two, three questions. If you could um, go through those, uh, get to the question and we'll get those answered. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll address them in the order that you put them up. So 3A, um, mm -hmm. the question about the minutes and the action log. Can I start by saying, in the review of the actions um, earlier, you talked about action three, and I note that the due date has changed for that. Now, due dates shouldn't change. Forecasts, um, actions will be late and forecast dates will, will change, but the due date shouldn't, shouldn't change at all. It should be, the, it was um, in the, it was the only action in the action log minute at uh, the last meeting. And the due date was the 21st of the 10th. We now seem to have got a due date of March. So, so it's I think, kicked down. So I think Mr. Mr. Tizar, one of the things is we have been in a pandemic, so we have suspended all non-essential activity because really with staff absences, everybody was once again redeployed. So, Rory, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, no, not really. I mean, I think that it's exactly the reason you described, Haney. I mean, the other bit to say, I suppose, is that all of our, you know, things like resources and, and my team around things like public engagement are all, all been redeployed to, to, to the vaccination programme to tackle the pandemic. So a number of issues like that, have been slightly delayed. It's true, which is unfortunate, but it doesn't yeah, make I mean, that. that. <laughs> to interrupt yeah. you, sorry, that yeah. wasn't the question. It was a governance issue. The the due date shouldn't change. The forecast um, date will change for all the reasons you've suggested, but you can't keep changing the due date on, on the actions. No. OK, so we'll make a note um, of that and put a note that it has changed um, because we are in a level four pandemic. Right. Yeah. If, okay. if, if I may, uh, I, I think the the, the the point is valid. I mean, on on the system that we've we've got in the background, we do log the original due date and uh, uh, and when it is actually going to come to the. And I, I think we can put that column in on what we present, Fine. so it's clear yeah. how long we've taken. Yes, there is point a due made. date in the in the col a column for due date, but it changes the whole time. Yes, I, I, okay. I, I, so, I mean, we represent it more accurately. Yes, thank you, thank you for that. So moving on to the rest of the action, the the my concern is the minutes. Um, again, it's a related issue. The minutes are published so late that if if uh, um, if they're inaccurate, and they will be 
by definition inaccurate and I accept that um, um, drafting minutes is not an easy task. But if you publish it early, we can see whether anything has been missed off, and make sure that it's added before it's too late. Because now we've got an issue where um, an action was missed on two um, consecutive uh, uh, governing body meetings. And so we're six months down the line and it hasn't been addressed. And so I think that it's good okay. practice to publish the draft minutes. And again, the minutes that were circulated earlier weren't marked as draft. Were they draft? And um, when are they approved? And I understood from Josie that she was waiting for approval before she um, um, published the draft minutes. And I think so it's just the a question. question of the question, the time of the minutes, point taken. Simon, could you just respond to that, that that will happen? If I, I can only say people have been redeployed and people have been working flat out. Um, so, yeah, Simon, yeah, anything I, I, further to add? I, I, I would I would just say, I mean, we, we publish the papers that are going to the governing body and the governing body meets every three months. So that's why the public uh, gets to see the, the, the minutes published at that time. I do accept we can uh, spin them around uh, quicker and I can tweak the process that once uh, the, the, the chair and the AO are content with the draft, um, we could perhaps publish them uh, at, at that point okay. rather than wait for the circulation of the full set of papers. Thank you. Yeah. That would be really Let's helpful. go to the next question, Mr. Tizard. Um, which one do you want to take next? Your order is well, different to mine. Patient engagement. You've patient, got engagement. patient engagement. But again, this was, the, this was the one that I raised back in um, uh, July. Um, and there was an action taken at the meeting to give uh, provide the evidence that the practices in Westminster had supplied to support their declarations that they had an active and representative uh, PBGs. Um, and I asked for that because some of them appear to be reporting that they have got active PPGs um, to justify the funding for them um, and that some of their patients may not um, recognise that declaration. Um, so I requested the time and I think it should be assumed that it was an FOI request for the evidence that was used by these practices to support their um, declarations that they have got active PPGs. Okay. Um Simon uh, and Rory, do you want to take that? Answer that question, please. So I, I can answer the, the minute in mm -hmm. point. Um, we, we did include uh, the action in the minutes, but it didn't make it into the action log. So we have updated that and uh, uh, apologies. But I think Rory can cover the, the meat, I think, of the answer. Rory? Yeah, it's, it's a question. Um, it's, it's really a question for our, our primary care team, which I know they are taking forward in terms of um, that detail in terms of, of PPGs. As I said at the beginning, we've had some funding now for work with PPGs, so we will be looking at all of that as part of a separate program on who's got PPGs running, and how they're running, how effective they are, all that sort of thing we will be doing. Um, in terms of the evidence, um, I will ask um, Javina, our primary care um, director, to, to get in touch with you about that directly. Um, I understand that it is being that there was a delay again due to the pandemic, but I think that is, is something they're on to and should be able to, to update you on. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, did you have an? That was it, wasn't it, uh, Mr. Um, Kizar, two questions, yeah? No, no, there was a third one. Transition okay, to the yeah. care system. This was the 1.2 million funding that was allocated to Northwest London, and part yeah. of that was to develop links to practice PPGs. Um, yeah. At, at the last meeting, uh, and I asked what how that funding had been used. And at the last meeting, um, you said that a review would be published in early December prior to release of the final tranche. And what I want to know is whether that um, review had been published and whether we could get access to it. And so, in other words, what's been achieved with the 60, 600 um, million, uh, 600,000, and what's going to be done with it? I put 600 million, 600k funding. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Rory, Rory, I, I that, yeah, Sabina. so I, I, yeah. um, my understanding is the remainder of the funding has been allocated to the CCG and then Q3 was released to PCNs. The review that was planned for December um, again was delayed due to the focus um, of PCNs and practices switching to uh, the COVID booster practice, but they are looking to complete that review before the quarter four funding is released. So yeah. they so Sorry, I, think, I, I think I think this is a, one of the things is they through the through December January practices have been working flat out 
on looking at COVID positive numbers, referring, uh, looking and seeing who need to be referred for remote monitoring, who needs to be referred to the CM. So people have been working flat out on the COVID pandemic. I think let's just come out the other side of this. I think the focus on PPGs, there's a there needs to be a renewed focus on patient participation groups as we move forward. A point is well taken. I think people have just been just been working flat out. And combine that with staff absences, it has been a very tricky December, January. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, I think I've next one more. Is, oh, I couldn't see your. Which it, was your next the, question? Perhaps the most important one on the um, okay. vaccination program. Um, if you yep. haven't got it up, we, 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 no, no, we, we are taking them in in agenda order. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll I'll come back to you if I may. Thank you. Okay. Right. Next, um, Eve Eve Turner, you had a um, number of questions. Over to you, please. Yeah, I'm just unmuting myself. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, my report was uh, sorry. My question was about. Um, I've got two questions. I don't know if the other ones there, but on hospital yeah. discharges. So yeah. in in your report. Um, you talked about the sort of whole priority of in, in short about really, really about dealing with discharges. And I am aware that it's been repeatedly talked about the height that the numbers of people which it's been more difficult to discharge. And there is this new national target for reducing by 30 percent the numbers of pa patients medically optimized, but not yet discharged. So I've got three. Um, I think I had three questions. Did I ask it two? No, it's two. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, Perhaps you could provide a, a little bit more detail on what exactly is meant by medically um, optimised. That was my first question. Yeah. And my second yeah. question is one of concern, which is that mm. clearly hospital discharges can be quite complex and staff are obviously working under huge pressures and certainly have been over the last um, few months. So it's really about trying to understand what procedures will be in place if this whole new target is followed to ensure that patients okay. aren't going to be discharged without adequate and suitable support in the community or yeah. at home. Okay, that so, is a concern. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Jennifer's going to start to answer, but can I just say so it's really important um, on both these accounts that the there is a clear, there's a clear definition of being medically optimized. And we know we need to maintain flow in the hospital. Otherwise, we start having problems with AE, LAS handovers. And we know that people staying in a hospital bed, if they can be managed outside in the community, provided they're medically optimized, is the right clinical pathway for them, obviously with the right support in place. And I know that across Northwest London, James Benson has been has been leading this piece of work. Um, Jennifer? Sorry, thank you. Uh, my camera's not working at the moment, so apologies. So thank you, Eve Turner, for your question. So basically, the clinical decision that a patient is medically optimised is actually made by the clinicians in the hospital with the MDT team. And this is at the point where um, um, Mahina said about which this is a point where the patients um, can be assessed or have the continued care at home in a non-acute setting. So we do have some step down areas like clay ponds that we can send our patients to. But we would always risk assess and make sure that these patients have a plan of care when they go home. So they may, may need some um, like physiotherapy and they may need some assessment by the CHC team. So we ensure through James Benson and his team and the work that they're doing on a daily basis that these patients are managed very closely. So we do have the infrastructure in place within the community services um, and the capacity to ensure that patients, once they're discharged home, they get the support from health, social care and the voluntary sector. So and I think just to reassure, yeah, yeah, just to reassure Eve that um, the the director of adult services um, and James Benson team meet twice weekly to go through. So, so there's very much um, a hands on um, uh, work on this and, and people are also targeting readmissions and we have not seen um, because I think it was Radhika who quite correctly asked this question in gold uh, once, and it, we know that the readmission rate um, is not um, is, is, it has not increased um, as a, a way of since we've been managing the discharges in a safe way. But but this is where health and social care are coming together to work. Can I just um, next Mahini? But just I'm still 
you were going to give me a longer definition of what medically optimized met, whereas what Jennifer yeah. did was talk about how decisions are made and didn't sure. really answer that. So. so, so I guess I guess medically optimized would be somebody who d does not require any further medical intervention that needs to be done in the hospital. That person will absolutely need continuing treatment which is felt can be given appropriately in the community, whether it's continuing medication, whether it is doing blood results, whether it's a review of how that is, how that's matters. So it means there is nothing that the hospital is going to do that is going to be different. Uh, that's 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 what medically opt and this is always done. Decision is made in a multidisciplinary way. Thank you. Next question. You had another question, ICS Constitution. Yes, it was just really that um, I did ask a question. It was in the minutes at the last meeting, and was told that um, because consul that was told that because the consultation wasn't required by statutory legislation, it wouldn't be happening. But we would there would be webinars to explain the changes. But since that time, I have seen that a number of ICSs in other areas have taken up some public consultation despite it not being part of their legislation. So I'm. I'm basically saying in the interests of uh, the ICS, if you like, being more inclusive, perhaps uh, it should be considered to do the same as some other areas have done um, and whether that's been considered at all. But if not, perhaps. Thank you. Be. Thank you. Um, Simon and Rory. I can answer that. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think anywhere is actually formally consulting, Eve. I think some yeah. other, what, place, what some areas have done is to share their constitution, sometimes information about their initial thinking for, for public, you know, for public consideration. Obviously, our chief executive, Rob Hurd, only took a post on the 6th of January. I know he's quite keen to have those conversations with people, so it probably wouldn't be, but it's just, it's, it's a language thing. I don't think it'd be badged formally a consultation. Engagement. We would certainly right. seek views yeah. on, on our initial thinking. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. So I think, I think that's reasonable, isn't it? What you see, what you're seeking is engagement. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, can I then move to Mr. New? Mr. New, are you there? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm just, that's it. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Palmer. Um, yeah, a follow on, really, I suppose. So we have raised this issue a few times um, in terms of transparency for the ICS, which is getting ever closer. Um, and it's always been said that that's going to happen later. We still haven't had any uh, assurances that some basic provisions will be in place, that uh, papers and minutes will be in the public domain, um, nor that there will be some mechanism for both the public and for elected representatives to ask questions. Uh, and I just feel in the absence of that, um, it's quite worrying that we might mm -hmm. lose some of the um, transparency that we've got at the moment. I understand how much pressure everybody is under, um, but that doesn't seem to have stopped this huge reorganisation pressing ahead. And given that it is, I think it's important that some basic accountability principles are laid out of what's mm. happening. <laughs> Okay, Simon, this is talking about the partnership board. Um, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, well, yes. Uh, so we do, uh, as as far as we can, apply the same public interest test uh, as we do to any papers. Uh, we publish the partnership board papers uh, already. Um, to uh, assure you, the aforementioned draft constitution for the ICB uh, has provisions in it uh, at paragraphs 38.1 and 38.2 uh, that, that basically says the default setting will be uh, meetings in in public um, where the, the, there is not matters of confidentiality and the usual tests uh, and that the papers and minutes of those meetings would also be published. So I hope there's some assurance that can be drawn from that. OK, thank you. I think um, next governing body we can uh, we can we should be able to be in a better position maybe to be update on where we are with the ICB going forward. Yeah. Thank you. And next question is again, Mr. Tizard, back to you for COVID vaccinations, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, we're, we're still languishing at the bottom of the table for vaccination uptake uh, in the UK, sorry, in England. Um, and clearly this will have translated into um, 
avoidable hospitalizations and deaths. And one of our charities has, has canvassed the oh, most vulnerable. They are and to release people from hospital. Could, could somebody go on mute? People go on mute, please. Thank you. And um, yes, we're, we're told that the main reasons for hesitancy are trust and access. And the one person they trust is their GP, and the one place is accessible to them is their surgery. And in, particularly in rural areas, it's been shown that the most successful practices are vaccinating their most vulnerable at the surgery. Why can't we? I'd first of all like to acknowledge all the initiatives that have taken place in, in um, uh, Northwest London and Westminster in particular um, to access them. But one thing that we haven't tried is getting our GPs to start offering vaccinations to just their most vulnerable patients in the surgery. Can we do so, please? Um, Andrew, are you going to take yeah, this well, question on the mobilization of vaccinations? Yeah. So I, so I can do this one. Ian is probably going to do um, do the next couple uh, on vaccination. Um, just to say, Northwest London, uh, with regard to the booster campaign, has been a for a long part of the programme was the best um, sector in London and London was the best uh, air region in the country. Um, um, so Northwest London, as far as the booster campaign has been doing incredibly well. Um, there are lots of reasons why we think we might be falling behind with regard to population and recognising where, where populations are with regard to vaccine uptake and that's a piece of work that we're doing all the time. Um, we have set up an SOP, a standing operating procedure that does allow practices to deliver their COVID vaccination from their surgery um, and PCNCDs do, uh, do have a process whereby they can um, deliver vaccine to practices uh, and set up clinics that run vaccine campaigns from individual GP surgeries. That, that's been available uh, for the last three or four months and has been happening in some practices as well. Um, so there are lots of different ways that we've been delivering vaccine from PCN sites, from pharmacies, from pop-ups in community centres, but pop-ups in primary care in, in GP surgeries too. Uh, your question around AZ, there's a range of vaccines um, that are available for, for people to get. Um, Pfizer is by far the most common one. It's the one that we have in most abundance um, and it's the one that practices uh, are using. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are the ones that are most recommended for the booster campaign because of their particular makeup um, and Moderna's being used in the pharmacy sites. Having said that, we do have AZ vaccines, a small amount of AZ, AZ vaccines available across Northwest London, which we're using up uh, as required. Okay. Thanks for Thank that. you. Can I just okay. add that I mentioned AZ because um, of the storage issues for the for the other vaccines. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I again, I accept that the, the, the pop ups and the pharmacies, but these most vulnerable patients who often don't have English as a first language know their GP. They probably don't know their pharmacists. I don't know my pharmacist, but I do know my GP. And I'm really encouraged that you've changed the SOP so that the um, practices can uh, give the vaccin uh, uh, vaccinations. Would it be possible to get some feedback on which of our practices are just doing just that? Yeah, we can pick that up as, as an action. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alex. Alex Cowan, question from you. Alex, are you there? So this question from Alex Cowan about the household booster vaccine. Um, and the question was around how many household vaccinations have been done in England and those which have not been done, how will they be completed and what's the timeline? Andrew, could you pick this one up or is it yes. be Ian? So yeah, thank you. Ian Bateman is the, um, is the new SRO for, for vaccine complaint. Ian, are you happy to pick this up? Yeah, thanks, Andrew, and uh, thanks to Alex as well on the call for the for the question. So I think this is specific to Elin, uh, where uh, the nineteenth of January there were around seventeen hundred patients that were that would fall under the eligibility criteria for a household uh, vaccination and a household visit, of which fourteen hundred uh, have received their 
their biz, their booster in their visit, which leaves about 330 outstanding. Now, there'll be many reasons potentially for that, including we have to bear in mind what prevalence looks like in London. And therefore, some of those people, unfortunately, may have contracted COVID and therefore there might well be a need for them to wait 28 days until they can receive their, their booster. We've liaised with our colleagues uh, in the NHS in Ealing and they've given us a reassurance that they've worked with all of their GPs to identify people that are eligible and they are continuing to work through any remaining doses that are needed uh, by the end of January. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next question is from Mr Keegan. Mr Keegan? You had a question on household, housebound patients as well. Mr. Keegan, is he on the call? No. Um, and his question was around the booster vaccinations for, again, for housebound people. Um, Ian, is there anything you want to add to that? And you've given the numbers there yeah. on the housebound and, and our trajectory to get that. Anything else you want to add to that? Please? I think just just chair, just maybe two very quick points. Um, mm -hmm. so the, the uptake across Northwest London as a whole, which I think this question relates to, is is sitting just uh, below eighty percent, uh, which is great. And in terms of the specific question around definition, um, patients that fall into that housebound category fall under two definitions usually, which is either temporarily housebound due to a acute sure. condition or housebound due to enduring physical or psychological illness. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Um, and the campaign around boosters continues. Um, the last question is from Mr. Sharp. Um, are you on the call? Yes, certainly. Oh, great. Um, can I? Time. OK, OK. Thank you. Right. Well, this question uh, relates to the take up uh, relating to the booster jab and paper. 6A, slide 6, makes it clear by numbers that uh, there were about three quarters of a million people on the due date, the 10th of January, who were eligible for but hadn't received the booster in northwest London. Now, to solve a problem of this kind, you need to break it down into parts, which doesn't seem to have been done in public. It hasn't, why hasn't it been recognised that one of the groups of people who haven't got their booster jab are those who are perfectly willing and they're waiting because they have to wait three months. And so efforts should surely be targeted on those who may have had the first jab among the 1.7 million um, or even the second. But uh, they're hesitating for whatever reason. It may be lethargy. It may be the message that's coming from the government that, oh, well, a micron isn't so bad after all, our fears haven't been realized, so uh, don't worry too much, because there is a clear relationship between the government's public health precautionary measures and whether people are motivated to take up uh, the booster. So I would ask the question, do we know how many in Northwest London are in the group who are just waiting their turn in the three months, or uh, those who are hesitant and who need, you know, to be okay. and persuaded. So I As think, uh, Ian, Ian, Ian um, Ms. Sharp, did you want to ask your, your second question, which also relates to oh, community pharmacies and vaccinations? Yes, and then well, your last question is separate, then we can pick that one up. Yes, well, uh, if, if you wish, this is a minor local question, but our councillor, who's the lead for public health, told us that some a popular and well-used community pharmacies in uh, northwest London, northwest Six, where I happen to uh, live, uh, and in the residents' association, were not being allowed by NHSE to uh, uh, offer uh, vaccinations. And it varies, but there are some places where it's much easier to go to a pharmacy than it is to get an appointment with yep. your GP. So, if there's any knowledge of that, it would be useful to know. And then. Thirdly, I'm concerned about the situation in A&Es. Uh, two members yeah. of my steering committee have had experience of the A&E at Northwick Park recently. One case was a patient, the other taking somebody else. And uh, there's a notice there that says maximum capacity of this room 30 and 60 people were counted waiting. It surely yeah. there's a great yeah. risk in A&E departments at the moment. And what is being okay. done, you know, to mitigate it. 
Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll pick up the a &E question. Ian, um, can you pick up the two questions on the vaccinations, please? I can. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sharp. So I think you, you've quite rightly pointed out that the the number of people that become eligible for a booster dose will, will change every single day. And that changes every single day as a result of the need to wait those 91 days after your, your second dose and also to wait uh, 28 days uh, post a positive COVID test result. Uh, the total number of people, and this was at the 19th of January, the total number of people who were due a booster, so were 91 days past their second dose, stood at 428,924, uh, to be specific. Uh, to distinguish between those that are willing within that cohort, those that are willing to take up their booster, um, and those that aren't, is obviously a, a, a difficult task, given there's 428,000 in there. I think one of the things that we can do is provide some reassurance that once people become due or overdue for their booster, we undertake a, a range of activities in order to reach out to those people via our primary care colleagues, via our GPs, via call centres that we've got set up within our borough teams and via other ways of communication and messaging to help them understand that they are due that booster and they are eligible to receive it. And through some of the engagement work that I know Rory mentioned briefly earlier, we're working with our local communities to help drive the message of the importance of that booster. Uh, but we recognise that there is a challenge with that and there's, that's not a challenge that's specific to Northwest London by, by any stretch of the imagination. But we are putting a significant focus moving forwards on how we engage a, a more hyper local level with our populations to help them understand the need to access not just the booster, but also the first and the second dose of the vaccine if they haven't done so already. Okay, thank you. Um, just on the question on just on the question on the A and E, there has been a lot of work happening through. Through, through the winter on this, as you know, um, general practice um, has, has been providing extended hours. As a consequence, we've had the two hubs in place um, as well. Um, and there has been a combination of both remote working, virtual consultations and face-to-face. -face. It has indeed been a difficult winter for all the reasons that we know. Um, they, they, they have been right through the whole of December, we've had daily gold calls in trying to work through um, the details of this and how this has been managed with the mutual aid, with um, UCCs operating to the top of their license, with the hubs, which were which were again uh, ramped up uh, just before Christmas. So all parts of the system were under pressure. Um, and I think everybody did the best that they could um, under some some very very adverse circumstances, and this was was of course this time compounded by um, staff staff sickness. So thank you. That brings me to the oh, end sorry, of. May I come back, please, uh, Mr. Yeah. Tizar came back about six times. So um, uh, on the question of the, the four hundred and twenty eight thousand who are as it were due uh, a booster, having had the second jab. Surely it's easy to distinguish those who have booked, uh, you know, the place which they were allowed to do in advance, but haven't got to that date, and those who haven't yet made the booking. Surely those are the people who need to be contacted and persuaded, hopefully, to you know, to have the jab. And I'm not clear from the answer whether that has been made clear. Thank you. Ian? Uh, so... I, th I think we have to recognise that having having a booked appointment doesn't necessarily always translate through to, 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 to having a vaccination. We keep a really close eye on all of our bookings and our capacity across um, across the sector. Uh, but we'll we'll take the specific question in terms of what those numbers look like um, away and see whether we can come back to you on that. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, somebody's got their hand up. Um, Richard. Uh, th thank you. Look, this uh, this is a response to Mr. Sharp, actually, just from um, experience. I can't, obviously, the plural of anecdote is not data. This is one person's experience. But I spent several hours last Friday at one of the vaccination centres making telephone calls to one particular cohort within the group you're talking about, which was those that were clinically extremely vulnerable. 
myself and that there were others making parallel phone calls. I would say that th these were to clinically extremely vulnerable people for whom their booster would actually be a fourth jab. And I would say that around two thirds of the calls that I was able to get through to, which was several dozen, um, were extremely positive and made immediate appointments that day or the following day. Um, and there were others who made appointments for further down the road. There was a subset who needed to talk to a clinic, a senior clinician, a consultant before they timed their booster dose. But really just to say, I saw from my own experience there that there were there was active um, you know, practices in place, programs in place to co make proactive contact with people. And I felt reassured by the fact that that process was there. Thank you. Thank you. That's thank you. very thank, thank you, Richard, for that's really helpful. Thank you. That brings me to the end of the questions uh, from members of the public. There have been questions uh, not on the agenda, not related to the agenda, and Rory and Simon are going to get those answered. Um, the next meeting, governing body, is on the 17th of March at 10 o'clock. That will be my last chair, governing body as chair. Um, but thank you very much for coming um, and have a good evening. Bye for now. Thank you, Mahini. Thanks, Mahini. Thank you.